Good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. All right, it's a little bit better. Hi, everybody. I'm uh, Kurt Weigel. I'm president of the Downtown Development District, and I want to thank you all for being here. Uh, this has, in fact, been a, a wonderful day of sharing in uh, creative industries and arts-based business, and uh, it's the Downtown Development D District's pleasure to welcome you all here today. On behalf of our Board of Commissioners at the DDD and our staff, as well as our partners, the Creative Alliance of New Orleans and Louisiana Cultural Economy Foundation, I would like to thank you all for joining us for Creative Industry Summit and this year's Downtown NOLA Artspace Business Pitch. I would also like to thank our outstanding panelists for a very spirited and informative conversation on current developments in the creative industries and tips on how to be successful. Welcome to our final event of the day, the fifth annual Downtown NOLA Artspace Business Pitch. This pitch is aimed at identifying and supporting entrepreneurs that have the arts-based project or products situated in the creative, architecture, technology, digital media, or film and entertainment fields that benefits downtown and is scalable. Downtown, we are happy to say, at the Downtown Development District is the region's epicenter of creativity and entrepreneurship. And the DDD is committed to offering and promoting the resources that allow local artists and entrepreneurs to grow and succeed downtown. Like last year, we had a number of impressive entrepreneurs submit applications, which made the judging tough. And we would like to thank all of the candidates uh, and wish them great success in their future endeavors. However, we could only choose five finalists to participate today, and we would like to thank the, and congratulate them and wish them luck. And we'll introduce them in just a few moments. Each of these finalists is committed to conducting business in downtown NOLA. They have the ability to foster a hub of innovation by attracting talent, economic activity, and buzz to downtown New Orleans. The DDD, along with our downtown partners, will award a prize package to the winner of seed capital and of seed capital and pro bono legal, accounting, public relations, real estate services, and workspace valued at over $40,000. I would like to take this opportunity to thank our partners for their contributions and continued support, including the Creative Alliance of New Orleans, Louisiana Cultural Economy Foundation, Corporate Realty, Jones Walker, Postal Thwaite and Netterville, Beta, Wisnia, Culture Up, and joining us this year for the first time, Domain Companies and The Shop. Please join me in thanking all of our sponsors. I want to thank them for investing not just in today's activities, but for their commitment to downtown NOLA in so many ways. Finally, I would like to introduce and thank this year's panel of judges. Uh, I don't know what order this is, so I, everybody's important. Um, first of all, our DDD Board of Commissioner, uh, one of 11 who serve us tirelessly throughout the year, Ms. Jade Brown Russell. Just raise your hand. Ms. Chantrell Austin of the Louisiana Cultural, Louisiana Endowment for the Humanities, sorry. Ms. Jean Nathan of Cano and Philip Gunn of Postlethwaite and Netterville. Before we get to the main event, I would like to acknowledge that this is our fifth year of doing the Downtown Knoll Art Space Business Pitch, and I'm very proud of the success of all of our previous winners. Uh, I do know that we've got at least one of the winners in the audience, uh, Ms. Colin, Colin Ferguson from Where You Art. Where are you, Colin? Just one of the many alums who continue to make us proud. So con congratulations on your continued success. Uh, and just before I go on, I want to thank our, our staff. They never put the thank you to themselves in the remarks they write for me. Um, but I want to thank uh, Laswanda Jones and uh, Lee Ferguson for, from our economic development team. 
Raise your hands. Where's Laswanda? And Devana Doyle and Katrina Neely from our communications team. So let's get started. Uh, we've got a simple format, five minutes for each of these finalists to pitch us, and then five minute Q&A with our judges. The first in alphabetical order uh, is Gigzy LLC with their presenter Ali Alexander. Test. It's on. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Oliver, and uh, together with my business partner, Robert, and seven very talented artists, we run a photo and video production agency here in New Orleans called Gigzy. Um, These are some examples uh, from the last couple of months, some of our, some of our clients. Um, Gigzy focuses on two huge problems in the industry. Um, the first problem is that there's no photo and video provider out there that's truly focused on understanding the needs of organizations, designing content plans around those needs, producing excellent content while being affordable. And sticking to that budget consistently. Um, the second, problem one. Ah, it's not going. Can you change the, oh, problem two. The second problem is that there's a huge rate of unemployment in New Orleans, especially between the ages of 18 to 24 years old. And because there are high entry barriers, especially to the photo and video industry, the, it's very hard for underprivileged artists to pursue photo and video as a career. So, um, Robert and I have operated as freelancers and as teachers throughout many years before starting Gigzy, and we've suffered through most of these problems, and we've realized that alone, uh, we can't really cater to business needs. Um, so, Gigzy, at Gigzy, we're really focused on team and community building. Um, this is the day in the life of our artists here at Gigzy. So yeah, these are our apprentices um, in our tiny space. And um, as you all can see, they're, they're very young. Um, we created a business model that strives to solve um, both problems catering correctly to businesses and their needs like while providing careers in the arts like for youth that would otherwise be unemployed or be working at McDonald's or something of this sort. So how do we do that? Um, we run cohorts uh, every six months and after we recruit our, our very talented artists, we capacitate them in-house. Classes happen twice a week, every week throughout the entire year. And, um, and we capacitate them in every technical and creative skill required to become professional photographers and videographers. And we spend the same amount of time and energy capacitating with all the business and soft skills required to, to, to survive in, the, in, in this industry. Uh, we provide them a consistent flow of work throughout the year. And we have an operation strategy that's optimized to manage um, when and where to plug in our artists throughout the production workflow, depending on their experience level and their maturity level and so on. And we live um, in downtown New Orleans. We live in the hub of all business in New Orleans. And this is key to our business model because it provides us daily contact with our clients and our, our future potential clients. And it, it permits us to understand our clients and their needs even before they, 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 they hire us sometimes. But more importantly, um, our, our artists um, that 
don't live in the hub of all business have to come here twice a week. So now, um, and they have the contact with all these businesses, and now they're not only these isolated artists around town, they're artists that have very powerful business skills that truly understand um, business. And so living in downtown New Orleans is key to the artist's growth, and it's, it's, it's definitely key to our business model. So we've been successfully catering to our 52 clients, and um, we hope to, that we change the lives of these seven artists, but our operations are growing quickly and our apprenticeship program is growing exponentially and, and we don't have the answers. And we really need your help as a community to help us grow correctly. So thank you, um, I hope to see you all around. We're running a headshot booth here. No, our apprentices are running a headshot booth. And yeah, that's Gigsy. thank you very much. You mean the apprentices? Yes. Um, it's built right now for them to come to us. Mm -hmm. um, we can definitely, um, in the future as we expand, create online courses. But again, there's nothing like this contact, especially because they have to come to downtown New Orleans. It's completely different than just um, learning from home. Um, but yeah, we're, we're, we're growing, so we're gonna have to adapt to, to whatever fits the needs. Second question is: I, I know you separated the apprenticeship from just your your regular business operations. Um, can you give us a little bit more uh, information on how you um, see your operation, you know, growing in the next, you know, two to three years, um, and what your revenue stream would look like? Definitely. Um, so our revenue stream, our estimated revenue stream for the end of this year is two hundred thousand dollars. And the idea is to exponentially grow that revenue stream um, throughout the next few years. Um, while the it, it takes us about six months to capacitate the apprentices to become fully functional as photographers and videographers. Um, to really thought out um, plan and, um, and they, they progressively take more and more and more part at the gigs um, throughout time as their experience level grows. We have a badging system, so on and so forth. So it's not completely, the, the apprenticeship program is not completely apart from the production workflow. We have um, quite a few um, photographers and videographers that we contract. Um, those are our pros. Um, we only contract photographers and videographers that are really bought into this whole idea of the apprenticeship program and so all the time to the great majority of gigs, the apprentices go with the professionals to learn from them, and little by little, they start taking over. Um, and um, so, and the idea is eventually, and it's already happened, we start hiring the apprentices first for a, a part-time position and eventually a full-time position. And the idea is that the apprentices eventually teach the next cohort of apprentices, and it becomes a cycle. What's the pay structure for your apprentices? Our apprentices uh, start getting paid since the beginning of the apprenticeship program, and they have a badging system. So as they gain experience, they gain badges, and, and not only experience, but also maturity, and again, like all the business and soft skills, um, contact with the client. So they start at uh, $10 an hour for shooting photography and editing photo jobs. And throughout the year, they go to $25 an hour for, an, for photo, for video, for post-production. And when they become pros, that doubles and progressively from there. What, 
what is your capacity for taking on new apprentices, new apprentices and um, is your growth limited in any way by the li any limitations in the number of apprentices you can have? So, um, no, this is our third cohort already of apprentices. So um, the next cohort um, is gonna double in size. This one was seven. Next one is gonna be about 14 or 15. Uh, we're not limited, we're just striving to make the experience rich enough. And it basically, we can only bring in as many apprentices as our production agency has demand because the, the, the core of the apprenticeship program is that they're gonna be learning and creating portfolio and creating experience through real life situations, right? Through real world jobs rather than just creative, you know, school jobs. So um, they, they grow in parallel. There's no limit. All we have to do is have a bigger space. And as our apprentices evolve, then they start teaching the next cohorts of apprentices. So it grows exponentially. Okay. So you say this is your third one. So can you tell us how many have gone through the first two years and how many are still working for you or how many have actually gone out and are working freelance or in other places in the industry? We started with three, um, the first cohort. Um, it was a very unstructured, it was the alpha program. Um, none of those you are with us right now. Finish up the answer, time's up. All right, and um, in the second cohort, we had another four. Um, two, no, two continued with us, the other two went to university, and um, one of those um, is operating as a freelancer. Um, All right, and, yeah. that's good. Now we have seven. <laughs> thank you. All right, thank you. Gigzy. <laughs> Next up, NOLA DNA. Our presenter is Joseph Makos, NOLA DNA. So many apparatuses here, I'm not too sure, okay. So, let me tell you the story about the greatest find in New Orleans culture and history this century. Two years ago, I was checking an ad online and I found an ad for a historic antique newspaper collection. I sent an email and immediately the lady responded to me and within an hour, I was standing in front of a storefront behind the Dixie Brewery on North Dorjois. Inside the storefront was 30,000 airtight plastic tubes filled with 50 years of New Orleans newspapers. This, news, this archive comprises, it was owned by the British Museum and it changed hands and eventually ended up back in New Orleans. There's 30,000 historic New Orleans newspapers that are sitting less than a mile from where we are right now in a warehouse. Now this archive is one of the rarest archives of this New Orleans content that exists. This archive is filled with all sorts of amazing content. We've been able to, in the last few years, we've been able to make a lot of partnerships and do a number of projects with a number of cultural agencies in New Orleans. Why NOLA DNA? Well, as we stared at the tubes, we realized that these tubes contain the proverbial strand on the helix of New Orleans history. So our project aims to do several things. We aim to offer uh, in people interested in New Orleans history research opportunities. We aim to offer businesses licensing and merchandising opportunities. And we're actually going to take this content and we're going to geotag it so that it can be accessible to mobile devices. This is a way for tourists and people who live in downtown New Orleans to more fully experience the, the history of the, of the city. Now this is history of, cu of culture, of arts. There's nothing like a daily newspaper that tells this, that has more history than any other medium of the time. So we have a history here that is the history of the development of downtown New Orleans. The trends show right now that consumers are becoming ever more fascinated with historical tourism. 
and new Enola DNA will assist the downtown area in maintaining itself as a leader in that industry. Well, what exactly does it mean to bring this history back to life? Well, we have 30,000 original newspapers. This is, this is the status of our historical archives. Has anyone used microfilm to research? We realize that microfilm has actually taken away our information. It doesn't make it searchable, it doesn't make it accessible to people. So this is an example of what microfilm would be. And as NOLA DNA progresses, this is what we're going to restore New Orleans history to. We can bring back color. We can bring back the life. We can bring back the lost stories of many people who have lived here hundreds of years ago. We can bring back the content. The content that we can bring back is data that can be searched through optical character recognition. We can license images from our archive to countless publishing uh, opportunities, whether they're digital or whether they're print media. All right. Newspapers are an unqualified snapshot into representing these slices of time, culture, commerce, neighborhood gossip, and world affairs. The digital platform allows users to drive into the towering stacks of newspapers with precisions of today's database and UI technology. Users can customize searches to their interests and purposes. This, this app that we will build will allow residents and visitors to more fully experience downtown New Orleans, discovering curious pockets of history they have never. They have never. Who cares about this? This is who cares about this. We've been covered by national news agencies on the East Coast, on the West Coast, radio stations, print news, journalists. Uh, journalists have taken note to this because it's an amazing find of journalist history. We've worked with a number of agencies in content sharing who have already been interested in using our data in their publications. So what we need, we need state of art scanner, we need cloud storage to develop our cutting edge database to bring history on demand to downtown New Orleans. We've done projects in research and education. We're working in content and licensing, but our most proudest thing is our work with the Historic New Orleans Collection and with exhibitions and curations. But the most important thing is the city itself. And that is where we build our mobile media platforms to dive into this information. All right, time is up. Thank you, Kurt. Great, thank you. That's NOLA DNA, <laughs> Joseph Makos. Next up, Opera Creole. Oh wait, it's question and answer? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Sorry about that. I'd like to answer a couple questions, if you don't mind. <laughs> All right, let's go. Um, my, my question um, is um, regarding scalability. Um, I know that this is right now in project phase for you, but what, you know, from a sca scalable perspective, how do you see this business growing? Sure. Um, and how long is it, is it, do you see a sunset on the business? Or, for example, once you get through that, that collection, I guess my question is then, then what's next if for, we your, did, for your business? Sure. Scalability, let's think about this. We have 50 years of New Orleans history. If we released one day of New Orleans history every day, we would be able to go for 50 years. So there's one answer for scalability. We could release interesting facts that day of what happened in New Orleans history that day. Scalability, the idea here is that we're going to use downtown New Orleans as a nexus point for dropping in this information and that we're going to grow it. We're going to start in the boundaries of, this, of the downtown area, Claiborne, Calio, Canal Street, and the river, and we're going, to, we're going to drop in all these data points, and then we're going to have that as our nexus point, and then we can grow it to uptown New Orleans, Central City. We can grow it out from the city that way, and eventually, we'll be able to grow it out to as far as this newspaper uh, wrote about. So international news, we can grow this into uh, regional. There's lots of regional content information. So scalability is we can grow it from the center of where we are right now, and we can scale it out, and we can keep moving out to have more diverse information, and that will draw us on eyes back onto downtown New Orleans from outside of New Orleans. And would it be a, pay would it be a paid app? Would it be a paid app, or would you... Um, solicit sponsorships? Or I think we would probably solicit sponsorships and give it away as a free app. Uh, it could, it, there's a few different models. I would, I would love to discuss those different models, but I think it would be a free app and then we would get sponsorships and do advertising that way. 
Um, although it could be the other model would be for a paid app, uh, but there's two different directions that could go. And I don't think, uh, I think we can figure that out as we move forward what would be best for, for downtown New Orleans. Thank you. So you own the content. This isn't content that's owned by the Times-Picayune. It is not owned by the Times-Picayune for many reasons. One, I've done the due diligence and I've hired intellectual property attorneys. The Times-Picayune did not renew any of their copyrights pre-1930. So uh, pre-1923 is public domain, so pre-1930. So all this content is open. But the answer there is that you have to have physical originals, and we have the physical originals. Okay, and you see merchandising and licensing the imagery as being the primary source of revenue? I think it's one stream of revenue. It's like licensing and making those products and uncovering that history is one part of it. I see an app as another part of it. I see academic research projects as part of it. There's many different avenues that can be, once we have the content digitized, there's many different avenues that we can, we can uh, go into. How many current employees and where do you see an employee base going? Uh, right now I run on a single employee and an entire team of volunteers. Uh, I would say at least, I've had at least two dozen volunteers have helped with this project over the course of the last year alone. It's people who want to get their hands in the history and really experience it on first hand. So it's really been a, a, a community uh, a, a sort of partnership with people who come in and are really interested in working in the archive. Uh, I see it as eventually developing into a full team and a full staff of people where we have a digitization team, a design team, uh, a content team. Um, but I, it, absolutely, this is, a, this is a project that creates jobs. What have um, organizations such as the Historic New Orleans Collection um, said to you about the possible partnerships with your work? <laughs> they, <laughs> the Historic New Orleans Collection, and, and we are in deep conversations and long-term partnerships. This is something that we've talked about, that we're, we're talking about curating exhibitions in five years from now. We're talking about curating exhibitions for a long time from now. Um, deeply working with them on uh, tricentennial things, curating the first jazz archive, or the first uh, uh, jazz history and their new exhibitions that they're putting in their new building, which is going to be a French core history. This archive is playing a pivotal role in those, in those exhibitions. All right. Thank you. Now, thank you, Joseph. Apologize for kicking you off too early there, Joseph. All right, great. Thank you, NOLA DNA. Next, Opera Creole. And our presenter is Giovanna Joseph, Opera Creole. Bonjour mes amis, ça va? Ça va bien, oui. I'm Giovanna Joseph, founder and director of Opera Creole. We are a nonprofit organization dedicated to researching, performing, and educating the community about the contributions of people of color to opera and classical music from 19th century New Orleans to around the world. And we are dedicated to Creole culture in general. I could not have started this uh, opportunity with anyone better than my best partner in crime, my daughter, Aria Mason. We came together. We came together and decided to use our expertise as artists, as, as arts, in, um, arts educators, as administrators and historians to reach out into the community and take African-American singers to places they would not expect to see opera singers in the first place, and certainly not African-American opera singers. Some of the venues that we have performed and have had contracts with, Historic New Orleans Collection, um, uh, let's see, Jazz and Heritage Festival, we're the only opera company that performed for Jazz Fest every year. Uh, French Quarter Fest, New Orleans Film Festival, we opened the Whitney Plantation. Uh, we've done Music Box Village. Um, we've worked with the French Consulate. And so many, many, many opportunities. So today we're here to ask you to help us to bring 300 years of history to life, to go to, into the 19th century uh, and look at those hidden figures 
of New Orleans history. And this will be a project for the tricentennial. So if I were to come up to you and I would say, would you know what I was saying? Would you know where to go in the downtown area to find out what I was saying or find out the context of what I was saying? This is from a Creole folk song arranged by the Louisiana lady, Miss Camille Nickerson. And in the song, she says, which means I love you like a pig loves mud. <laughs> so we want to tell her story and bring her story back to life. Most people don't know that New Orleans in all of North America is the first city of opera. First operas ever performed in North America were here from 1796. And during that time, we had five opera houses. In those opera houses were free people of color who were violinists and cellists, not only trained here in New Orleans by the best musicians, but also in Paris conservatories. From that group, we had many composers of color that emerged. Edmond Dede, born a free man of color in New Orleans in 1827. Charles Lucien Lambert and his son Lucien, and Basile Barre are just examples of 19th century composers. Now, we decided we would go out into the community, but we didn't want to be, you know, those stuffy opera singers who stand there like this. We wanted to give exciting and engaging and connecting performances, and that is what we do. This is from our 2015 production of Minette Fontaine, which was set in New Orleans. And this outfit was from that because I was Marie Laveau. So we took Marie Laveau to the Jazz Fest, as only she can be. All right, our next production coming up this May is called La Flamenca, written by Lucien Lambert, the son of Charles Lucien Lambert, a free man of color and free composer uh, in New Orleans. It debuted in Paris in 1903. He studied with Massenet, the great French composer but it has never been performed in America. And so this will be the full production uh, in May at the Marigny Opera House. So what do we offer? What we want to do is create an experience in the downtown area. Because there are lots of places that you can go for Creole history or African American history. They're not immediately accessible to the tourists or travelers. So you would come to us, we do historical contests, concerts, um, a photo exhibit, and we talk about Creole culture, Creole language, and what I envision is a three-wall projection so that when you come in and you sit down, you're sitting in a theater, in, in the, the middle of the French Quarter, and we have that experience. I'm uh, on the board, I'm actually the board chair of the Louisiana Creole Research Association, so they will be a partner because they have excellent journals. We are talking with the Civil Rights Museum, which is coming up soon, and other entities like the Ace Hotel. So the funds that you give us will support, of course, African-American opera singers. It allows us an opportunity to buy projector equipment, musical equipment, to take care of our, our marketing, um, and to begin right. to do Giovanna, more. Time's up. And we are, I am actually finished. <laughs> Merci beaucoup. <Thank> you. <laughs> All right, thank you, Opera Creole. Thank time you. Time for questions. Are you guys already currently located in the downtown area? No. Okay. Um, so my second question is, how would you use the, the, the um, pr funds or proceeds um, funds. and in-kind proceeds from um, the business competition? So we, we need to establish a location. We want to work with a tour group to be the culminating event of a tour group. But we, we need equipment to do some of the things that we want to do, projection equipment, to create this environment of stepping into New Orleans, the three wall projection. Uh, we need, we, right now when we go out, we go to places that have pianos, that have the things that, that we need to perform. So we need to uh, establish getting our equipment together for that. Um, that's, that's part of it. Anyone else? Just a related question. How, how would, you know, one of, the, one of the things we're looking for is a business that you, you can scale up to su mm -hmm. substantial size hire more people, create mm -hmm. more revenue. What, what would be your longer term plans for scaling? 
Uh, we have uh, many things in mind for Opera Creole. Right now we have about 10 or 12 singers that we use for different things. Um, this will give us an opportunity to grow a young artist program uh, that we can bring young people in to be incubated in this, uh, in this area to, to learn this history, to learn this music, which you just can't find anywhere. It's not being taught in the, in the uh, uh, universities and that sort of thing. So we have the opportunity to grow in terms of bringing them on board and having them as being artists. We also would like to branch out and become like the Louisiana Lady, ambassadors for New Orleans, where we can take these historic works to different places and, and engage more uh, and hire more African-American opera singers. One of the other things that is, a, that is a future goal of ours that this uh, springboard will help us do is we need funds for great operas like this that I have in the original hand of the artist Edmond Dede um, that has never been performed in its full context that needs to be transcribed, uh, rewritten so that we can make uh, the, the French has to be uh, translated, and this is another big production that we would like to put together that no one has ever seen. So we do have a lot of, a lot of goals that would allow us to grow. We are a nonprofit company, so I didn't really think too much in terms of putting a lot of, in, in terms of dollars, but it is expensive to have a life as an opera singer. We, this is an athletic situation. We have to keep our skills up. We, uh, there's many things that we have to do that, that make life expensive for us. So I like to keep them hired. So that goes to my two questions. One, whether you have some kind of a business plan, and two, how do you market what you do? How do I say the second part? Market. Mark, how do we market? Um, well, we need more in terms of hard copy uh, type of marketing. Uh, I, have, I have become just uh, joyful about internet marketing and newspaper articles. We've been covered by the Times Picayune and The Advocate Many, many newspapers have been very interested in what we're doing, radio stations, uh, and so we've been very, very lucky in terms of all the press that we've gotten, and we continue to grow upon that. So we are, we are in development in terms of really pushing our business plan, but we really want to grow in terms of this being a wonderful historical moment for Louisiana that we must try to reach out and do, because these people have been hidden figures. We have our own hidden figures. We think about the Creole culture in New Orleans, that in 1862, $2.5 million of property were owned by free people. And they were entrepreneurs and composers and journalists and civil rights activists. And we want to tell that, that story within the context of the music and showing how we work together to push the boundaries and to create freedoms. Um, and it's just a great history. You brought up a target for the tricentennial. Do you yes. have a specific partner or site or someone you're working with to try to accomplish that short-term goal? Right now we're working with the, what's in process now, the Civil Rights Museum, um, which we're um, understanding will, will be connected to the Cabildo in some way. Um, we are talking with the Louisiana Creole Research Association. Um, I've been in talks with the Ace Hotel as a, as a possible site or a connection with their concierge to get people out to wherever we're performing. Um, looking at, around to see the theaters, and maybe it, it can be an arrangement with La Petite, um, something at Gallia Hall, but it would be within the historical context of downtown. Approximately how many bookings or performances do you guys do annually? Oh, we're, we're pretty busy, surprisingly so. Very busy. Am I out of town? Yeah, <laughs> we're pretty busy. Thank you very much, Giovanna, from Opera Creole. Merci beaucoup. Next up. Next up is Becky Wazen from Two Girls, One Shuck. I could listen to Giovanna speak all day long. <laughs> a 
late one night at a crawfish boil. The boys got drunk and left a sack of oysters abandoned and forgotten. With one tea light candle, an oversized chainmail glove, and one oyster knife, my co-founder shucked that sack of oysters. And I saw the beginning of an amazing party trick. Ice cold oysters are an electric edible experience. To have a fresh oyster shucked right in front of you is a luxury we love to provide. Two Girls One Shuck is a full amenities traveling oyster bar. We bring raw and char grilled oysters to the location of your choice. We want you to enjoy your own party and to socialize with your guests. We are the seamless shucking solution. Hi, I'm Becky the Oyster Girl. I moved here from Utah 15 years ago. Yes, an oyster girl from landlocked Utah. I have almost two year, uh, 20 years of experience in restaurants, bartending, and education. My co-founder, Stefani, grew up in Oregon, hunting, fishing, and wrestling anything that moves. It didn't take long before we, we realized this idea was much bigger than just the two of us. Meet our lovely, mighty army of Lady Shuckerettes. Last year, we doubled our equipment to be in two places at once. These lovely ladies help us to share the oyster love all throughout New Orleans. And do you want to know why? Louisiana is the highest producing state of oysters in the nation. That's not surprising. But did you know Louisiana produces 35% of all shell stock? That's more than one third. And to wrap your brain around that, we make 100, upward of 100 million oysters a year. Needless to say, the priorities of my business design were as such. We are clean shucking, jive talking, playful professionals. You always get two lovely ladies at any event to reduce wait time at the oyster bar. We don't speed shuck, we clean shuck because those oysters were grown perfectly in nature and deserve to be presented as so. I intentionally do not keep a brick and mortar restaurant. Instead, I have a catering kitchen where I clean and store all of my equipment. And at the beginning of 2017, we were granted the first ever exclusive mobile oyster catering license from the city of New Orleans. I'm very mindful about the future. I personally know the oh, oysters are having an amazing research of popularity, both locally and globally. Here in New Orleans specifically, from the healing of both natural and man-made disasters, a true oyster renaissance is at hand. I personally know my oyster farmers and only source safe, sustainable seafood. We recycle our oyster shells with the Coalition to Restore Coastal Louisiana. They use the shells to reline oyster reefs because baby oyster spat loves to grow on other oyster shell. And for marshland protection, you see me standing on a half mile barrier reef created with, I'm standing on one single ton of oysters there. That's in Biloxi Marsh where if there's any hurricane wind, or surge protection that's gonna protect the grasslands behind it. I'm also a self-appointed oyster ambassador and advocate. I love creating shucking classes with groups such as NOCA Culinary Arts and First Line Schools Edible Schoolyard so that I can still my love and interest in oysters with the next shucking generation. I am, however, very mindful about the future of my business, especially when it comes to turning up the heat on sales. Bam! Last year, we added char-grilled oysters to our offerings and saw an immediate 50% increase. And they are delicious. I use Frank Brightson's garlic butter recipe. If anybody wants it, I'll give it to you. We are still a young company. We're in our third year of business and very optimistic about the future. I'm very excited about the possibility of a partnership with the Downtown Development District Creative Alliance of New Orleans, and the Louisiana Cultural Economy Foundation. Right now, my office is located in the heart of downtown New Orleans. We have had the pleasure of sharing our oyster bar at several downtown hotels, private residences, venues such as Cellar Door for their New Year's Eve celebration. We were at Lunafet with the Arts Council of New Orleans at Lafayette Square. And last summer, on the main floor of the Superdome, 
I had six lady shuckers open 2,000 oysters right, for 5,000 people for the IPW convention. Time is up. Thank you. All right, thank you. <laughs> Questions, panel? How would you use the funding or the awards if you got it? How would that help you grow? Since I've never been a business owner before, I would really love some mentorship on accounting, legal services, and marketing. It would be very beneficial for me. Tell us more about the uh, impact on downtown NOLA other than uh, providing services downtown. How would you impact downtown? A personal goal is to just more exposure for the Oyster Bar because we can bring it to the people. So a lot more of my friends that are living in New Orleans are moving into the downtown area. I like being able to access their private homes or their own businesses. Um, I think the portability of what we do can take us keep us in the epicenter of downtown, which will just naturally start to spread out. You said you got the first mobile licensing. How many currently exist, or is it still? Just it took me three years to get my health permit from the Department of Health and Hospitals, City of New Orleans, Orleans Parish. The complication was the moving of the oysters. So a lot of restaurants do oyster catering. What we're doing is not new, we're just putting a new twist on it. So what I created was a whole new HACCP plan with the health department. I have a mobile refrigerator in the back of our catering van. So the oysters are always kept at 39 to 41 degrees. And it's all about the transportation, the movement of the oysters. So my commercial fishermen get them out in Hopedale, bring them to the city of New Orleans. His warehouse is actually right off Calio on this side of the Superdome. I call him downtown. He brings the oysters to my catering kitchen. I then transport them in my refrigerator on site. Um, I'm, it's, it was a complicated um, procedure, but now that we've come this far, I'm very proud of what we built. And I also think DHH is on board. They call us a very innovative business, which I find nice, and yet I tried to explain that New Orleans have had a love affair with oysters for centuries. <laughs> so you recently... Um doubled your capacity by getting, uh, I think you said, some additional equipment that allows you to have two parties at once, and you diversified your offerings by moving into char-grilled. Um, do you see any additional, or, or I guess in the near future, any uh, expansion or growth uh, options? Twofold to the question. I've made a very conscious decision to not go beyond the scope of oysters, because I have a really great friend that does crawfish, and I want him to do my crawfish. I know other caterers that do amazing seafood. So first of all, I'm going to stay with oysters, because it's my love, and what I feel really comfortable and passionate about. Where I see growth coming is a second catering van, more job opportunities, and I do actually hire gentlemen to work on our behalf. It's not just women. <laughs> and I've had an outcrying of support from the whole, all the oyster folks in the city. So that I see our growth potential being definitely with job opportunities. A second catering van would be miraculous. And that's pretty much five year plan at this point. <laughs> thank you so much. All right, thank you, Becky. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Two girls, one Chuck. Next up. Thank you. <laughs> next up is Young Artist Movement, Alberta Wright. Hi, my name is Alberta Wright, and I'm the daughter of two artists, and I've been an art educator for over seven years. Everyone in this room knows art is powerful. Art saves lives. And we also know that residents and visitors alike are drawn to our city for its art and culture. 
but they're also disturbed by our violence and crime. Young people are implicated in this violence to a heartbreaking degree. And this is a big, thorny problem that doesn't just have one solution. But what's clear is that we need more meaningful opportunities for young people to engage in critical out-of-school hours. So what if one of the ways to help solve one of our city's most intractable social problems was by making it more beautiful? What if a way to help interrupt the school-to-prison pipeline was by stimulating the creative economy? Young Artists Movement is New Orleans' first citywide youth mural initiative, engaging youth, artists, and communities in sustained public art and placemaking. Here's what we do. We offer a community-engaged, high-quality mural research design and installation service to organizations and responsible real estate developers. We offer, through that, job training and um, transferable entrepreneurial skill building for youth apprentices who learn those skills through collaboration with artists, communities, and clients. Our city is ready for this, and here's why. First, the creative industries are growing. We have 10,000 job openings in creative digital media by 2025, and when overall employment in our city was down by 19%, cultural industries grew by 15. We also have more foot traffic in the downtown area, but most of the public art is concentrated on a busy thoroughfare that's hard for pedestrians to access and made mostly by international artists. We need to build on those international artists' presence by connecting them with communities and creating more pedestrian-friendly experiences to match the pace of development. Finally, the approval process for murals has been cumbersome and led to uh, murals happening in isolation, but we're working with the city to change that. So we're looking at precedents in other great American cities like Philadelphia, Miami, and the Bay Area. But we're building a program that is uniquely New Orleanian. We do this through the collaboration of our partners, building on each of their strengths to bear on our program components. Youth development organizations recruit and inform program design. Community engagement partners facilitate workshops and dialogue. And our public art partners will coordinate with artists and walls. We're a hybrid project-based model. 35% is earned income from our services marketed to real estate developers. Um, youth stipends are covered by existing city workforce development funds. And we're even in conversation with two private sanitation companies to do mobile murals on the side of their dump trucks. We have 65% grants and donations, and some of this is already existing in federal percent for art funds. At scale, we can bring together consistent, meaningful work for youth and artists, buzzworthy public art destinations, and sweat equity from the community, which will lead to decreased vandalism and blight, economic stimulation, and research shows lower crime and better health outcomes for youth and the rest of our city. We had a great pilot program that exceeded expectations. Youth partners and our uh, wall owners are ready for the next project, but we were funded by a majority one-time source. So this is a pivotal moment in our growth. With the prize from the Downtown Development District and cash and services, we can build a website and social media platform that allows us to simultaneously recruit youth and develop business grow our summer project from 11 to 25 youth, and create our first uh, developer partnership with a responsible real estate developer. Our vision is to change the culture of public art, youth voice, and development in the city of New Orleans. And with your help, we can make it a reality. Thank you. All right, thank you. I'm going to bring my team on stage to answer questions, if that's okay. I don't know if that's allowed, actually. <laughs> yeah, I don't, nobody else did, Alberta, so I'd say we'll just stick with you. Okay. Um, all right, uh, Q&A. 
Do you have specific sites or locations in the downtown development area targeted for your murals at this point? We have actually today had conversations with, just happened to have conversations at NOE with three different organizations. I don't want to name them just in case that, that doesn't work out, but I, we see the potential um, already in those conversations with businesses downtown. Mm -hmm. um, I know that um, part of your goal is to ensure that young folks are you know, doing something substantive with their time, but are they paid as artists? And if they are, um, what does the pay structure look like? Um, versus what they receive versus what um, you know, a typical client would pay? Yes, so they are paid. Um, they're paid a stipend, and they're paid eight dollars an hour um, because they are not, um, you know, W two employees. That stipend is paid out in a lump sum at the end of the program, and they'll receive bonuses for positive employable actions, and conversely, docs for the opposite of that. Um, yeah. Uh, tell me a little bit more about. Uh, the work that you're trying to do with the city about the approval process for murals. I sit on the HDLC and we just had a very rough meeting where I had to defend a couple of murals that they were encouraging to be taken down. So I need to understand how real that process is. Yeah, so we, um we're working on that through our partnership with the Arts Council who um, helped us execute our pilot project. Uh, essentially, we know that it's a long, hairy process that is not going to happen quickly, but we believe that if um, we're building a sustained, um, uh, organizationally supported um, structure for mural making that connects youth, um, the city can't help but to support that by creating perhaps a trusted vendor relationship or something that recognizes the fact that we are putting in the kind of work to make the process easier by managing it, finding the artist, and not making it sort of a one-off situation each time. I have two questions. Sure. Um, uh, one, are you currently based downtown? And two, how is it that you access real estate developers? So we are not, we actually are, that slide I showed you with all of those people, we are a collective of a lot of different organizations that come together in meetings in different locations. So we don't have a base yet. Okay. Um, and your second question was again? Um, how do you access real estate developers to engage them in these conversations about murals? So as I mentioned, we've had conversations informally just through our connections. I mean. The, the group really represents a lot of assets um, that we bring to bear on, on seeing this vision through, but that's a really big reason we hope to win this award is so that we can use the corporate realty services that are part of the package to learn more about how to formalize that. Yeah. How long has the organization existed and what's your projected revenue or fee income for the coming year? So we, um, we formulated about a year and a half ago, um, sat around a table and, and figured out mission, vision, values over that year. Um, our pilot project happened in December, um, or, or ended in December. And um, can you tell me the second part of your question again? Uh, what's your projected revenue or fee income for the upcoming year? That is a great question and we don't know yet. Um, we have to learn more about what our next project will look like. And again, this is a reason why we would really love to win the award to work with some of the legal and accounting um, services that, that they would provide. Are you, are you guys formally a nonprofit at this point or is it still just in project phase? Project phase, we're an initiative, um, and we will, as we continue building project to project, we will um, scale that model by having different, um, so you, I talked about the different kind of partners and what they do. Um, that can sort of scale into a manager per partner, whereas right now it's just one that coordinates those partners, if that makes sense. So this, I, I think one of your slides showed 65% Grant yes. You guys raise funds through other nonprofits, or how, do, how does that typically work? So we raised the majority of our um, of the funds for our pilot project through um, Prospect New Orleans, Welcome Table New Orleans, um, and one other source. Okay. 
that I'm forgetting right now, but any other questions? Thank you. All right, thank you, Alberta. Your artist movement. Well, thank you to all of our presenters. The judges are, are going to, uh, we'll go somewhere, I'm not sure where we go, <laughs> and deliberate. We expect to be back here in about 20 minutes, so please everybody stay close, and we'll come back with our decision. Thanks. <laughs>